I went to high school, the Aragon High School in San Mateo County a number of years ago, and I was very active in trying to give students a voice back then as part of our city's Youth Advisory Council, pushing for a student member on our school board. And through those and other activities, folks would always patronizingly say, oh, this is so wonderful. You're preparing yourself to be a leader for tomorrow. And I was thinking, aren't I trying to lead today? Um, you are all today's leaders, and we need you to step up because the state of California children and youth is not good. It's not good when compared to your peers around the country and even in, in many other countries around the world. I wanna just give you a few rather depressing stats before I talk about how we together uh, can change this and really make California the best place uh, to live for young people and to prepare for our future. So here's just a few stats from Children Now's report card where we basically grade the state on key indicators of child well-being. So first, chronic sadness and suicide ideation among high school students. It was reported um, in terms of chronic sadness, 30% of straight high schoolers, 58% of gay, lesbian, and 68% of bisexual high school students reported feeling chronic sadness. And in terms of suicide ideation, 13% of straight students, 39% of gay, lesbian, and 47% of bisexual students, according to this study. This was before the pandemic. These were from 2019 statistics. In terms of academic achievement, believe it or not, California ranks near the bottom of the 50 states. Huge gaps um, among races, although none of our kids are achieving as, as well compared to peers in other states. But we have over two thirds of our black and brown kids not meeting grade levels in terms of math and science in the third, eighth grade in, in high school um, measurements. There's gaps in terms of income, also gaps in terms of race, even putting aside income, which shows something about the systemic racism in our education system. Another stat, we, in those in government make decisions about how much we pay public servants, people working for our government. The average public employee in California makes over $81,000 a year. The average preschool educator makes 34,000 and the average childcare provider 26,000. These are decisions we collectively make. In some, people who work with kids in California are paid less for people that don't. And many of, our, many of these public employee jobs don't even require a college degree, where jobs like being a teacher, uh, which is slightly below even the average for a public employee, requires um, a bachelor's degree plus additional education. And uh, one other uh, stat is that we rank near the bottom in education funding. We straight up 39th of the 50 states, but when you factor in for cost of living, we rank even further. Compare that when I was going through the public school system way back when, when we ranked fourth per capita in spending for education. So we have a lot of work to do, and I can give you so many more statistics, but let's just delve into a sec for a minute. You know, why aren't kids more of a priority? Why don't we turn these statistics around, not just here in our state, uh, but throughout the country? I hear a lot of excuses for why kids aren't the priority. One, kids don't vote. Well, first of all, we, we tried just recently in California to ensure that 17 years olds can vote and we're continuing to work towards that. But when you think about that, uh, that quote excuse, think of lots of other interests that do so well in our, in our public policy decisions, whether in Sacramento or Washington, DC. There aren't that many people in the major financial services or different business enterprises that, that vote, and yet they have a lot of, lot of power. So then people say, yeah, but those have money. Well, there's a lot of money behind kids. I think you're familiar with the fact that there's lots of philanthropic efforts and people donating for different kids' causes. And in fact, if you aggregate that, there's as much spent behind doing right by kids as many of these other interests. So an another argument you hear is, well, voters don't care. It's not true. Now, there are, there's a 
set of the population in California nationally that has not been very supportive of kids' issues and, and especially needed equitable education and other reforms. But for the most part, the vast majority of, of Californians do strongly support um, putting kids at the top and all kids. I mean, there's lots of polling that shows, for example, Californians would raise their taxes to ensure that undocumented kids in California got the support they need. But I would argue oftentimes the majority of the public is ahead of the political uh, elite. So what's going on uh, here? Why aren't kids more of the priority in terms of our uh, public policy making? Well, I would argue that it's because the advocacy that the, when to, in terms of advocacy efforts to put kids at the top of the agenda is far too disconnected. Think, for example, of advocacy for seniors, one group, AARP. Think of advocacy efforts for labor, for business, for uh, gun rights, very consolidated efforts uh, to, to push their effort um, in, in terms of reform. Even when you look at uh, the desperately needed ref uh, reforms for our police forces last summer, even during these so, so powerful protests, one entity, the police unions, was able to block major reforms in Sacramento last summer. So we see successful interests being very connected, very coordinated. When it comes to the kids' world, we have thousands and thousands and thousands of amazing organizations, including youth-led uh, groups. But when it comes to advocacy, that many groups, if they're all disconnected, makes it very hard to come together and push for the needed uh, changes. It's particularly a problem in California, uh, where I, in addition to running children now, teach California politics at, at UC Berkeley. What I highlight to my students there is that California legislative districts are huge. A, a million people in a state Senate district, half a million in assembly district. In many states, you, there is only three or 4,000 people in a legislative district. So the, the general needs, the needs of, of what folks are talking about every day get communicated to their legislators because the districts are so small. In California, very few people actually know their legislator. So what happens is interest groups, big interest groups dominate what happens um, because you don't know your legislature, so you base your, your vote or your opinion of your legislator on what an interest group says. So what's really needed is essentially how do we create an interest group, a powerful collective voice for kids by respecting these thousands and thousands of diverse voices at diverse organizations fighting for kids in California. That's where the Children's Movement of California comes in. It's a unique effort that many around the country are, are looking at modeling, where we're saying, let's bring together every group that wants to see kids prioritized in public policymaking and bring them together as a network so folks can speak at the same time, at the same strategic time with one voice demanding that kids be prioritized. The Children's Movement of California now has over 4,100 diverse organizations throughout the state and growing. There's actually 93,000 nonprofits focused on kids in California. Imagine if all of them were part of this network. So what does this network mean? Well, one, it's a way to connect folks and share research and, and the condition of kids in California, but also very powerfully, it allows for collective action. Hundreds and hundreds of groups to, to speak at the same time. So I just wanna give you a few quick examples of how we're changing things in California and putting kids at the top. Last summer, there, in terms of the state budget, there were proposals to cut services and programs uh, throughout the government, including major cuts to K through 12 education, childcare and other key health programs for children. Those proposals we were able to block by getting over a thousand groups to send a joint letter to the governor and legislature saying enough is enough, now is the time to prioritize children. And other interests in the state were cut much more severely and, than kids and kids programs were finally protected because of this huge combination of folks coming together and speaking with one voice. That's very different than many past years um, in Sacramento where it was kids programs that were cut more than any others. A few other uh, examples, we've been, we, the movement came together, putting the pressure on getting schools reopened as quickly and safely as possible this year due to the pandemic. Um, school discipline, an issue where we saw 
far too many kids of color, particularly black kids being basically expelled from school because of quote, misbehavior. Um, through the movement, bringing hundreds of groups together, really pushing to get that change um, so that that uh, bad behavior in and of itself wasn't something that was gonna get a child expelled um, from school. And we've also used it for in the area of child welfare and our foster youth um, that set the movement came together to help push a 24 seven crisis hotline where any foster youth, parent guardian can call at any time for help and support. Before this hotline came into existence, you, you know, most of these youth had two choices, either a suicide hotline or calling the cops. Now there's an ongoing support for these uh, young people and really something that all students should have, have access to. These were the kinds of reforms that the children's movement can help push through. More funding for kids, needed services, needed supports. And the final example the children's movement has been uh, pushing to ensure more transparency in education funding. California actually has a unique law that really provides more equitable funding where English learners, foster youth, students in poverty are supposed to get more dollars uh, for their, their education than the baseline of students. Um, but that law has not been implemented effectively and the children's movement has been pushing to ensure that those dollars really get to each kid intended. So things are changing and it really is an exciting opportunity to bring organizations together, uh, diverse groups throughout the state, each pushing their own needs and their own agenda, but coming together on the biggest issues facing youth. And when we have that kind of collective action, it can make a huge difference, basically create a lot of fear in a good way and really change things in Sacramento uh, to finally get our kids um, at, the, at the top of the agenda. So let me close with why I'm optimistic that we can really change the dynamic for, for young people in this state and truly put uh, kids at, at the top of the list. And I say that because I actually think that's where most people are. When I was first elected to the state legislature, um, the, the first week in office, I visited a homeless shelter in my district and I went around talking to the folks there and I went up to one woman and happened to say, I'm gonna be at a meeting with the governor tomorrow. What do you want him to do for you? What should I ask the governor to do? This woman looked me straight in the eye and said, you don't need to talk about me. Please tell the governor to make sure my kid gets a great education and gets the health care that she needs. I think that sentiment expressed by that woman expresses where most of us are, meaning we care so much about the future generations. We know it's our collective future. And when push comes to shove, we need to put our young people first. If there's any silver lining out of this horrendous year we've all experienced due to the pandemic, is I see fight folks finally realizing that kids have been disproportionately impacted and why we need to put kids at the top of the agenda. So I think that's where much of the public is. I think we need to be very sophisticated and strategic in how we come together. But I'm hopeful that those statistics I shared earlier about how we have in too many ways have been failing our kids can turn around and that we can make California the model of how a state treats its young people and ensures a positive future. Thank you.